The Roundtable is powered by Patreon, and those patrons are wonderful, talented people who are making a difference in this world, including Raid. He has brought an amazing task upon himself with his Kickstarter for Monster Peppers, sparking a new era of plant breeding to adapt towards the planet's climate change. This Kickstarter aids not just production of delicious peppers to grow, but a story-driven webcomic to accompany these peppers. Yeah, uh, does the food you normally eat have lore with them? Didn't think so. He's seriously doing an amazing thing, and I can't wait to see the final result. To support this revolutionary Kickstarter and learn more, a link will be in the description. And to support the roundtable and get a shout out of your own, head over to patreon.com slash roundtablevids. Shoutouts are our highest tier. Welcome back to Mini Mayhem! I'm Ostrich Vox, and Star Season 4 continues with Doop Doop and Brita's Tacos. As always, if you have not watched these episodes, go check them out, then come back. With all that said, let's start with Doop Doop. We begin with Star reading a book from Alphonse the Worthy, the sea captain who's painting his planet throughout Mini Castle and Star's room, which briefly spoke to Marco in Blood Moon Ball. Alphonse the Worthy is Eclipse's father. Although he never wed Solaria the Monster Carver, Star is reading his Atlas of the Multiverse to figure out where to go on her trip with Tom. And although it ends up not coming into play in this episode, we're likely not done with this book yet, as one of the final episodes of the series is titled Tavern at the End of the Multiverse. Atlas of the Multiverse? Tavern at the End of the Multiverse? Oh yes, we're seeing this again, but we'll touch on that soon. Marco and Star make a reference to the Pi King, which makes me wonder if this is just a continuity nod, or if the Pi King and his Pi Folk will have a role in the series' endgame. After all, being Star's true heritage makes that entire island a bit more deserving than a one and done. Marco and Janna end up moving back to Earth. Their time on Muni finally coming to a close now that Eclipsa and Globgor are happy and together. With Eclipsa coronated, Muni's officially out of Star's hands, so it's natural her friends would move on back to their proper homes. And and Janna's amassed a large amount of souvenirs. Speaking of Eclipse and Globgor, Star makes way to say goodbye to them, only to find humans and monsters truly are living in harmony. Things are going pretty smooth. I sure hope this isn't put into disarray for the climax. Eclipse and Globgor also baked a vegan human cake, which I assume things like that is how Globgor maintains his vegetarian diet, making food that looks and tastes like, I don't know, humans? It's not as creepy as I make it sound. Okay, it is. Star's goodbyes extend to Ponyhead, who laments at the fact that Star is leaving Muni for a while, until Star reminds her she still has the Ponyhead show, which leads to Pony summoning a now unimprisoned seahorse. Though he has a tracking device attached to his tail that reminds me of Ant-Man and the Wasp, although yes, I understand this is a real thing many ex-convicts under house arrest deal with, and I do not mean to patronize their struggle. Seahorse is under this probation for queen napping Eclipsa, and was said to be in prison for a brief amount of time in the following episode. When Star says her goodbyes to Buffrog, it's kind it's kind of funny how threatening Buffrog is to Tom at the end of that respected conversation, as Tom's not the one who begins to break a heart by the episode's end. There's a nice moment between Star and Moon that shows how much the relationship has evolved. Moon entrusting Star on this trip, although really, Star tries to get out of it. Judging Star and Moon's interaction here and comparing it throughout the series, it's like our own caretakers handing us the keys to the car for the first time. Wow, you really do trust me. So I'm very happy Moon and Star get to have this moment. It's very sweet. Star's apparent procrastination leads us to meeting her first ever spell, Doop Doop, a talking broom voiced by Justin Roiland. And yeah, he had that Morty voice down. I really enjoyed that this was Star's very first spell, as she is sort of a witch, and witches ride broomsticks, so it's a perfect nod to that entire trope. After this bit, Tom confronts Star on her stalling, which leads her to naming off a few more people she needs to say goodbye to, mentioning Rastacor, who's someone in her row gallery, although I find it hilarious that Rastacor has went from an antagonist to someone who's kind of antagonistic, but Star is almost on good terms with. I mean, she went from picking on him to inviting him to the coronation. Someone else Star's mention is Gemini, who's dead and will likely never see again, but it's nice to know that Star hasn't forgotten about him. If only Meteor didn't. <laughs> Tom and Star have an intimate, emotional conversation that really leads to the beginning of the end of their relationship. Tom deciding to finally put himself before Star by still going on the trip despite Star starting time to herself, letting her know his phone will still be on. Practicing the self-care and recognizing that there is still an issue between him and Star is very, very good for Tom, and I'm interested to see the direction his character will go in. 
However, this episode concludes with Star returning to Earth, bringing these final episodes back to the very beginning, back to Echo Creek. Star seems to have just arrived in time, as Marco introduces Star to not his baby brother, Marco Jr., but his baby sister, Mai Posa, whose name is Spanish for butterfly. It turns out the doctors got the genders wrong. Ah, uh, Raphael's comment about how the doctors get paid so much yet they still make mistakes? Yeah, that's very real. But welcome to the family, Mariposa. Ah, uh, she's so adorable. And now let's move on to Brita's Tacos. Picking up shortly after Dupe Dupe, Star and Marco are on the scene of Mariposa, hitting up Brito's Tacos, so Marco can embark on his mission to fill out an entire punch card. Hey, 10 of those can get me a free boba at the local bubble tea place. So yeah, I hope Marco lands something cool. This episode really has two key things embedded into its narrative. Whereas last episode saw Star say goodbye to Muni for a short while, returning to Earth and bringing everything full circle, this episode feels like it's giving a proper reintroduction, yet goodbye to a lot of the characters on Earth seeing the pals we used to hang out with in Echo Creek one last time. The other key thing comes in the form of the season Star and Marco find themselves in, Summer. Finally, payoff all the way from the end of season two. Star's first summer on Earth was taken from her due to the threat of Toffee. But now that Marco has spent a summer on Muni, Star can spend a summer on Earth. And she's already living it up, doing absolutely nothing, which sticks for the rest of the episode. Our first reunion of Earth characters comes with Oscar and Sensei, both working at Brita's Tacos, which I'm assuming means that the dojo shut down. It's a sad day for strip mall dojos everywhere. Sensei is the first of many characters to assume Mari Posa is Marco's daughter, not sister, which is a very realistic portrayal of the real world. Yeah, Marco's only 15 going on 16, but if you're over the age of, I don't know, 13, even 12, and you step out into public with a younger sibling that looks like they barely know the alphabet, you're getting labeled as a parent. Sorry about it, not my call. Now, I tend to assume it is someone's younger sibling, but with the race of teen pregnancy and very judgy boomers, can you really be surprised? I'm just more surprised everyone assumed it was also Star's kid. Marco hasn't abandoned his studies either, as an encounter with the principal leads him to whipping out his high school equivalency diploma, which means Marco has essentially finished high school at age 15. Darren Nefsi actually revealed on Twitter this isn't a clever workaround the plot, but that this came from her own experience experience. She did this due to having a tough time in school and didn't regret the decision. Nefsi, you probably won't be watching this breakdown, but you rock. You're bringing to light that there's not one correct linear path to success in life. Something kids will need to hear. They need to explore other options because kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, college won't work for everyone. Marco encounters Mr. Candle, confusing him for Sir Crandall, to which Mr. Candle says he doesn't even know what immunity is. But he was introduced as someone working for Tom, you know, who's from the underworld, which is kind of a part of Muni. So what? Star Fan 13 has a wholesome reunion with Star, which was one of the highlights of the entire season for me so far personally. While in the bathroom, Marco encounters a man who looks vaguely like him that ultimately gave Marco an epiphany. He was a horrible boyfriend to Jackie. He prioritized not just Muni, but Star over her, which you gotta be there for your best friend for a certain extent. But as Jackie said in sophomore slump, Marco went to Muni and really never came back until now. Ferguson and Alfonso introduced Marco to their new D&D group, stating D&D is cool now, and it is, with things like Critical Role and an abundance of references and animation as of recent, and shows like Dragon Prince, which is entirely just a D&D campaign. I'm more than happy to see this. Now, if you're curious, I'm a Dragonborn Oathbreaker, and if you play D&D, let me know your character in the comments down below. The name of mine is Nexel. As things look grim for Marco's mission by the end of the night, as Jenna is banned from Brita's Tacos, he's rescued by none other than Jackie Lynn Thomas, who's brought a friend, an implied girlfriend named Chloe. You know, I guess that statement from Sabrina Katugno is true. Everyone in the show is bisexual. <laughs> Jackie and Marco have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, realizing they can still be friends even if they didn't work out romantically. Marco realizes he's happy for Jackie, and Jackie advises him to not screw things up with Star. 
car. So now even she ships Sarko. And this is a very heartwarming moment. I had a smile on my face the entire time. I really am happy for both of them and seeing that they can still be friends because it's true. Just because something doesn't work out romantically with someone doesn't mean the entire relationship is down the drain. Some people are better off as friends and not significant others. And I'm glad Jackie and Marco fit that criteria. As this episode comes to a close, the prize for all 50 punch cards would have been a shirt, but the shirt was stolen. Bummer. I guess that's kind of cool, but ah, you know what? It was just a framing device. As always, I want to turn the conversation over to you guys. What do you think? Did you enjoy these episodes? Which segment was your favorite? And would you want to see Jackie pop up a few more times before the end of the series? Is there room for her? Let us know your thoughts on everything in the comments below, or tweet your thoughts at RoundTableVids. And for my own thoughts, you can find me at Vox. We're also on Instagram. You can help the Roundtable Girl by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please throw a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Ashik Vox, out.